Welcome to Change the Narrative. I'm your host, J.D. Fuller. I'm Susie Younger. An African-American licensed psychotherapist. I'm also a licensed therapist. We talk about the isms. We talk about the phobias. Anything that marginalizes and oppresses. As a white woman, I ask the questions white people are too afraid to ask. Everything we are not and everything we are is because of fear. Through a mental health lens, Susie and I will have difficult conversations with celebrity guests, political activists, and everyone in between. Our mind will tell us whatever we want to believe, but the truth lives in the body, and that's where change occurs. Are you ready to change the narrative? Our next guest is a human hat rack. She wears so many hats. She's a super accomplished artist musician who's recorded 13 albums, a filmmaker, a mommy, a partner, Her work has been featured at some of the most prestigious venues in the world, including the Whitney Museum, LACMA, and the Art Institute of Chicago, just to name a few. She is a creator, a writer, and the producer of the acclaimed Netflix original documentary, Circus of Books, a poignant and fabulous film about a Jewish couple running a gay porn bookstore, offering a rare and delicious glimpse into an untold chapter of queer history. Oh, and the couple just happened to be her parents. She's here to share her story and her amazing life. Welcome, Rachel. Thank you. Wow, that was a really nice introduction, Susie. I appreciate that. Susie's the introduction queen. I don't try to touch it. (laughs) I've never been called a human hat rack. (laughs) Isn't that great? (laughs) I think I'm going to use that. (laughs) It's good, right? (laughs) Um, So Rachel, yeah, you know, Susie said before we got on the air, it's a, I mean, getting to know you has been incredible, but also it's kind of unbelievable to look at you uh, Mm -hmm. and print all that you've done, but I'll get to that. First thing I want to thank you for coming on, especially on such short notice. I know we've been trying to book you and we've been having some challenges because your schedule is out of control. And I know you have so many projects going on. So again, I just appreciate you for so much for making time for us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Now, aside from Susie's introduction, how would you introduce yourself to our audience? Oh, wow. What a what a, what a good and, and scary question. How do I... <laughs> Oh, it's it's so weird. I think I often introduce myself based on the context of who and and you know where I am and what when I think when I think back on like the 13 albums, you know, it's so interesting. I have these things in my resume that um, you know, like I spent a big chunk of my 20s and 30s just making music as and I even now in my laptop I have like tons of songs and they're just sort of part of my um like, I don't know exactly how I would call it, but part of my identity on some level, like I just am sort of this prolific songwriter. But when I think on like the career side of things, like, Mm -hmm. you know, I never landed like a big record deal. And I never did things that when you say 13 albums, you know, when I like, for instance, making a film, that's what people know me now, because I had sort of a commercial success. But um, so I think of myself as being somebody that sort of manages to have this like very indie, non-commercial, mm. esoteric aspect of myself that, you know, people could say, well, why do you still keep making music if you're not going to, you know, try to, you know, angle it into, you know, this particular um you know, mainstream success. And and then I think, well, that's sort of what I've always done as an artist. Mm -hmm. I've just always, you know, like that's a painting I made behind me when I was 15. And I actually keep it here because it's sort of this reminder of like the impulse of like where it comes from um, to make art. And it it comes from a very non-commercial space. But now when I think on my resume and that kind of thing, when you're asking me, you know, again, that's what I was saying, depends on who I'm introducing myself to, because you know, if I ha- am on a PR mission to talk about my last film, you know, I, I really have to just introduce myself as a director and minimize all the other mm. sort of less commercial stuff. But in a space like this, which feels like a safe space, I can be more, you know, about who I really am, which is um, uh, a human hat rack. <laughs> 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 as you say. That's great. That's great. You know, I, I would explode with all that creativity you pack in that 
one body. How, how do you, how do you manage it? I mean, you said you manage it, but how do you manage it? You know, it's so, it's so interesting. Cause I, again, like thinking about creativity is so, it's so interesting. Like some, some days I, um, I do feel this sense that I, I've not been creative enough and I, um, and I just need to do something. And, um, you know, in some ways I think now, because, because of some of the successes that I've had, I, I, I'm getting to do less creative work, which is, mm. ironic. like when I, when nobody knew anything about me and I was, you know, had a little studio in a cave in a basement and, and was just plowing away, not making any money and, you know, barely getting by I, I actually was very creative whereas now i'm you know the stakes are high i have these big pitch meetings and i'm preparing materials and some of it feels like you know wow this is like the 12th time i've redrafted this treatment and it's not that creative but then you do something on a higher scale and then you you know get to create a in, a, in the film world a project which really can be vast and include a lot more you know, it, your, your project can be bigger and, um, more high level, but that's what I was saying. Like my actual time is spent emailing and drafting proposals and things that don't feel creative. That makes sense. Actually. It's like, you know, when you make the, uh, the bigger play, you know, you take that step mm -hmm. for, to be more commercial, as you say, then it does make sense what you're saying. Like it just really, I could visualize it. It cuts your time in half to be, to, to have that ex creative explosion go on yeah. inside of you. Yeah, that, that really makes sense. So it's a little, I mean, as much as it doesn't, I mean, it's first world problems, let's say that, but. Oh my God, it, totally. Well, you know, yeah. I mean, let, let me preface it with that, but it is also uh, a bit of a sacrifice, like a little bit of a selling off part of yourself right yeah no and I look at you know in a weird way I feel like I stumbled backwards into a successful commercial career I thought circus of books would appeal to um a, a really small group of gay men in particular <laughs> they would you know all of the ones that knew the store would be like okay cool I love it and then maybe like you know a little bit of the wider LGBT community that would just appreciate it I had no idea it was going to be mainstream ever. And if anyone had told me like millions of people in the, in the real world, outside of the, you know, comfortable LGBTQ bubble world that I, you know, reside in and within that bubble, the like artsy sphere of it. Right. I, I just, I, I, I wouldn't have believed it. And so I became sort of, um, uh, you know, a documentary filmmaker with, with, uh, and I love the doc, I do love the creativity of making docs, but the, the reality of like, you know, putting, you know, a, um, paint on a canvas or coming up with musical notes and like things that literally come out of the ether versus, you know, doing research and staging an interview and then crafting something in an edit. That's a creative, definitely is a creative um, aspect, but they're just so different. And, and I do feel like, the part of me that um, sometimes does need to do the esoteric weird thing has definitely gotten a lot less uh, yeah. attention, but I, I can't let sense. it atrophy because it definitely um, kills my soul if I, if, I, if I don't do any creative work. Yeah, and that's what fed the other. Right, right. You know? that, it's like, what came first, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I get these friendly reminders in the in the ether sometimes that I have to go back to doing creative projects. Um, and uh, it's really, you know, it's interesting how I, I do have creative um, work in the cr more creative sphere in the in the narrative film world. Right. So I've written some scripts, a musical right. sci fi project and uh, other things that are very um, narrative and um you know that's where that's where sort of my creative energy has okay. come so you know you said uh before we got on that you know a lot of that was in your 20s i don't even know what i was doing in my 20s mm -hmm. i i pretty much think i was just trying to survive the idea that you were creating yeah. and so focused i mean it's it almost seems like you started creating out of the womb <laughs> what, what did it look like that you started to be so focused at such a young age when most people are just really tripping over their own feet and 
continue it. it it's kind of interesting because I think I think on some level being an artist was was a um, like a security blanket because I was not very social. I was really scared of other kids, and it was really funny. The other day I was driving by my nursery school actually. And I, I still see these little bars on this area on the streets on Fountain near Crescent Heights where I, I went to a little Jewish nursery school. And I remember as a kid looking out of, and, and looking out of those bars. And I think I was only like three or four. Mm -hmm. And when I was in nursery school, it was so weird. I, I had a therapy session where I suddenly st said these words. And then I realized how wow, so many things come from that. I, I got kicked out of the sandbox. <laughs> And I remember it was my first day of nursery school. I really did. I, I walked up to these other kids and I said, can I play with you? And they said, no. And they kicked me out of the sandbox. And I remembered from that moment forward, I knew that I could sit at this little table and make art and nobody would bother me. And, and I remember the nursery school teacher saying to my mom, because my mom thought I had like a, you know, a social problem. You know, she just, she's just marching to the beat of her own drum. And many years later, my nursery school teacher, um, I don't even remember how, but she gave me some art supplies and it was so powerful because I remember thinking, oh yeah, like art really saved me from all this social anxiety because I could just pour myself into this thing that was on this table and I didn't have to talk to the other kids. And, um, I, you know, in some ways that's where I, I always feel like my safest, happiest place. So. Mm -hmm. I, I always relate to um, to people that have that impulse, you know, and I think it's like the great unifier among artists, no matter who you are in any classification in the entire world. I, I've always, you know, I've taught art in lots of different environments and there's always like that one kid that I can see just like needs it. It's like they're, they're they have to make art and it's their, it's their safety and it's the place they, they thrive. So I was that kid. You know, you make that so tangible. It just mm -hmm. makes so much sense. Thank you. I appreciate that. Well, you touched on it. So let's go there. You know, you mentioned mental health. You know, is that how you manage to spend so many plates in the air at the same time? Do you, how do you take care of your mental health is the real question. Well, I do have a therapist, which is. Yes, we love therapy. Yeah, I mean, I really, well, and I believe, I mean, I really, really wish everyone could, could devote an hour to therapy, you know, a week or however much they need. I, I mean, I wish it was baked into our society. It wasn't like, oh, I'm doing this great thing for myself. I mean, I really wish it was like, as part of our world as like brushing your teeth, that everyone just knows that they need a therapist. And like, I don't believe that a person needs a therapist. I believe like all people need therapists. Like, you know, I, and I just, I, I, for me, it's, it's totally something I came to, um, acknowledge as like it's it it just should be integrated into our culture in general so i i really appreciate you guys advocating for therapy and, and making it and being therapists too like as healers i believe therapy is a healing art but i just think everyone should have access to it and everyone should be it should be a more integrated thing in our, in our entire culture. So yeah, as far agreed. as my, yeah, agree. You know, I, I have uh, people who will hit me up and they'll say, you know, I wish I could afford therapy and they'll give me the whole rundown of how they can't afford it. And I'll say to them, I totally agree with what you're saying, Rachel. Everybody should have access to therapy. It shouldn't be such a specialized thing that you don't have access to. But I also wanted to give and do give these people the other perspective, which is insurance companies don't, really pay what they need to pay therapists to be on these insurance panels. And a lot of people have to hustle high level just to make a living. And so it's, they're not doing us any favors. The, the, the message is that, you know, we're making so much money. And if you're a, an insurance panel therapist, you really have to hustle for that money. So it's not the therapist you want to go after. It's the insurance companies. Those are the ones who oh, are, yeah. are creating the system. Well, That's and, a part of the system. and with that in mind, I mean, I'm to even open up the can of worms of like our, you know, medical industrial complex, you know, why, why are pharmaceutical companies given carte blanche and every possible commercial on television is all about trying to take some meds as opposed to 
well, first off, I, I mean, I believe medicine should be almost like the last resort if it's at all needed. And of course it's needed sometimes, but it's offered as the first resort. It's offered as like, take this. And for me, I would imagine, I mean, just in basic common sense, the numbers um, would be stacked in favor of insurance companies positioning therapists front and center. And, and like, you know, I've spoken a lot with Buck about this, that in the trans community, well, in all sides of every community, but in the trans specific, like the medical stuff is put before the therapeutic stuff. And, you know, in my mind, it's a money game. Who stands to make the money? Well, these giant pharmaceutical companies who are going to sell all of these, you know, um, see surgeries and, and um, um, medicine. And, you know, I, it, if, if I had to be cynical about it, I would just say it's, it's purely, um, you know, a money game. And um, yeah, I wish, I wish therapists had a stronger lobby um, to, to fight on the side of therapeutic medicine. Cause I think that is, um, well, first off, I just think it's better. <laughs> yeah. I think it's more important. I, and I know too many people that have spent their lives on medication that has never quite worked. So well, medication without therapy, that just doesn't make sense to me. And I, I don't, I don't think that should be allowed. Yeah, that's my, my professional opinion. So I hear what you're saying. Yeah, well, I just think it's, we have our, our, our culture is really um, stacked in favor of, of going for those options, as opposed to, yeah. I think, the therapeutic option first. Mm -hmm. So no, for me, that's, that's, you know, that's it as, as, as for why I love therapy, I just feel like I, I get so much out of it. Um, and it's not easy. I don't, I don't actually enjoy it sometimes. But I just know that if I don't do it, you know, in a way I leave myself vulnerable to, you know, all these other things that um, are, you know, could, could be more difficult, make my life a lot harder. I mean, right. I have to balance all this stuff. Right. Totally makes sense. I'm going to shift gears. Aside from Jonah, which we know he is amazing and your greatest accomplishment, what would you say your next greatest accomplishment is thus far? Oh, that is such a good and hard question, JD, because I think about that and it's weird. I, you know, on some level, I used to think in terms of like uh, artworks or, or films or projects, but I think I, I, I feel a little more like the accomplishment is less about any one thing than about, um, about knowing that I'm doing something that could be helpful. Um, so, I just, you know, for instance, I, I, uh, I've gotten messages from people having made circus of books that have really blown my mind, like that, um, you know, that, that it helped them like come out to their parents wow. or something that, yeah, really. And, and so on some level, you know, I used to think, oh, my greatest accomplishment would be like this cool song that I wrote or a, mm -hmm. you know, a painting or something artistic, but more so now, I think it's, not just making the film that has like circus books in particular, but, but the, uh, having gotten it out there, you know, the due diligence to do the business side, that's like when I, when I've learned about the, the art of the business in the film and entertainment industry and all these things, you, you have to work with these, you know, with agents and business partners. And on some level, I feel as accomplished we're having figured out a way to work with yeah. unruly schematic <laughs> people that I never knew about. And now I'm like, if it isn't for this group of people right here who devote themselves to finding the weirdos like me and making this thing marketable, I wouldn't have a film that anyone has ever seen. So I've, I've wrapped my head around the like accomplishment of of getting something into the mass media placement successfully as, as a big accomplishment for myself. Um, and, and that I, uh, I look at sort of as a group accomplishment. It's like all the different people that it, it took, you know, and that, and it is part of why I used to sort of, I think, look down my nose at like the industry in Hollywood and it just seemed very superficial to me. And now I think on some level, it's really um, profound. In this moment in history, when we have like creators that are that are really, you know, some of the most 
I, I would almost say like some of the most outsider people, like okay. like Lena Waithe, for instance, or Ava DuVernay or Ryan Murphy, they're like gay and queer and, mm -hmm. you know, not white, you know, just being at the center and making these huge, enormous changes in our culture, that is as a result of them and the power of who they are and their charisma, but it's also all the people around them and all of the integration of this unwieldy system that I got myself. Now I see it. I'm like, oh, this person had to champion her. Mm -hmm. She had to go and run back in and, you know, have that meeting with that person who took a huge risk. And so I see the system that is really evolving in a beautiful way right now for creators mm -hmm. that are making profound work in the entertainment industry. And, and I, I feel really excited about that, about being a part of that. I think it's great for you to offer that perspective, you know, because it's easy to be cynical about it. So yeah. I think that's a really helpful perspective for people to hear. Yeah. You know, well, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, I so appreciate that because mm -hmm. when I was an agent, what you're saying was my purpose, mm -hmm. finding the weirdos, celebrating them. And, and it's, no one sees the behind the scenes. No one sees the group of people and the passion and making the no's and like, okay, it's a no. That means I have to go next door. And so I just personally really appreciate what you're saying. Well, you know, yeah. Oh, sorry. Okay. No, no, go ahead, Rich. No, I just wanted to add to that because it's part of what is like, you know, the Wizard of Oz mystery now that I've opened that door and I'm like, oh, that's how like how did, you know, how did Ava DuVernay get to be this incredible creator that owns her own company? And now that I understand it, like, it's all of the people who are Sus the Susies who are taking chances on her or her advocating for her. She was advocating for herself, but like, there's all these people within this schematic um, that had to give these opportunities in places where it wasn't an easy or straightforward fit. And I've seen it with myself because I've talked to people like, well, I've never seen a gay porn movie ever do success, you know, anything successful. And here it is. It's like, well, and it's a family story. How's that going to work? You're always yeah. hit. And then you have this advocate who's like, actually, no, I, I believe in it. I trust it. And, and that's why in some ways for me, it's the, it's the Susie's, the advocates who are on the inside doing the hardest work imaginable to get some of these new creators their foot in the door so i i that is a huge thing for me and that's what i learned going in it's it you know the the creator like me gets all the credit we're like yeah i'm the director and you walk up on stage but it's really important to acknowledge all those people that you know put their jobs on the line put their neck out call made a call that they were nervous to make you know those are really that's how it has been working um for me and I and now that I see it I have gratitude for those people in, in my corner. Well I appreciate you putting that out there. You know Circus of Books was how I got introduced to you and then I of course had to know more about you and I want to know what was it like just just give us a, an idea of the day in the life of uh, the child of Circus of Books. <laughs> like what did that look like? I can't imagine. Well, you know, it's so interesting, um, JD, because I would say that my childhood life was so almost like suburban, but in the middle of the city. My mom was making every effort to shield us and make us into like almost like an exaggerated, successful Jewish okay. children. Like you, we, we didn't just have our bar mitzvahs my mom made us read like three times the amount of the Torah portion than like anyone else and, and it was an agony and I mean it was like a B wasn't good enough you had to get an A and you know with my mom my luckily my dad was there to temper it but you know she was she was really positioning us to like be be um successful in in sort of a, a very traditional track okay and I I never understood that later as maybe like overcompensating so that no one would ever you know look around the corner and see what we did but there were occasional moments when I you know there would be like a parent teacher day or something or you know and um what's it called career day where we would you know <laughs> say what our parents did and my mom always had this like big long explanation like okay first you're gonna say that we're in real estate 
<laughs> they ask about real estate, like mention that it's a, your parents also have a retail store. Don't say the name of it. You know, it's just like all of these weird explanations. And then, a, a, and then one time I accidentally let it slip because we were never supposed to say the name of the store. Okay. Of course, I didn't know that that, how unusual you could say my parents own a store, but don't say the name of it. <laughs> but we were really trained not to say the name of it and then one day I remember my teacher just really like got it out of me she was like come on tell me the name of the store and I I remember I said I my mom told me I couldn't do it oh. I cannot tell you the name of the store and then finally when I let it slip it was so funny this one teacher was like that's weird I never she's like I know all the bookstores in LA <laughs> I've never been there and I was thinking to myself, well, that is weird. If it's a bookstore, why haven't you been in there? <laughs> so, but it, another funny thing that was recent. That I, is such a great story, Wade. That is such a great story. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. This, well, this is oh. really funny. On Facebook, um, I reconnected with some of my elementary school teachers. And I, I, mean, I really had these amazing, they were so cool. So I went to I went to Wonderland Elementary School, which is a kind of well-known like um, school within the, I don't know if you want to call it like Laurel Canyon. It, it's okay. like known in LA as being the place where all like the the doors and Joni Mitchell and all, and you know, Jimmy okay. had all the kind of uh -huh. like artsy, artsy rock and rollers in the 60s lived so wonderland was kind of like a lot of kids of those you know cool hippie rock and roll type parents went to the school and my friends were like they had really cool parents they were like artists <laughs> and, you know okay. directors and, and dancers and my parents and kareem abdul jabbar's kids went there like you know oh. like it was kind of a you know, I don't know what the word is, like very LA hip, I guess. Right, right. But my parents were so boring. You know, I felt bad for myself that I, I could never have anything interesting to say, whereas my, my friend's parents were on set. And, but um, so I, I've reconnected with some of the teachers from that school. And one of them wrote to me and said she watched my movie and remembered distinctly when she asked me, what my parents did and she said I remember that both you she had had both of my brothers she said that you and your two brothers had the exact same almost like they had been fed the same answer <clears throat> about this question and she said in retrospect you know oh. she looked at it almost like a mafia style thing like, <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 you know, we were clearly told to say something and, and she, she logged it in her head as like a flat, you know, you flag this thing for like the social worker, like later down the road, like these kids were fed an answer, which is not correct. Um, Cause she said all three of us said the same thing. Like, well, we can't tell oh, you. Man. <laughs> oh my God, Rachel, that is so funny i i just can't even <laughs> funny <laughs> right? Right, yeah. and when uh. and we realize it's like porn it's pretty funny <laughs> <laughs> man you know i i don't even know what to say after that that is so darn funny i have to tell you your mom man she worked overtime oh yeah she worked, she worked in creating this business and then had another business right no Another really funny story I remember when I when I finally started to get old enough to like understand it, I, I thought it was awesome and hilarious. And of course it made me super cool that all my like queer friends were like, your parents on the circus of books, we love that store. Like, you know, I was I was with the the weirdo artsy kids, you know. And in fact, it's funny, you know, Buck is quite a bit older than me. And I remember the scene that Buck was in with like all the super cool lesbians back in the 90s those yeah. were the people that my friends like worshipped from a distance so uh -huh. and buck was sort of part of the culture of circus of books so it, it's funny in, in you know in retrospect i think like oh my god how cool is my life that i you know i'm c connected to the guy who i thought was super cool back in the I day just as like a distant you know not even knowing him um and um, so, so anyways, on that side, I, when I got old enough and I, you know, I would go to the store, like with my friends and it was fun. I remember one time walking into the back 
with a friend of mine and um he was he would we had this sort of idea to do some art shows in the store and he was like yeah let's talk to your mom about it so we walked to the back and my mom is just on the phone um placing an order for a bunch of videos and reading off the most crazy, <laughs> crazy and looking at me like just you know brazilian come shots part two and you know yelling at them like we already ordered the come shots part one and you know in hand <laughs> mansplaining like all these different like craziest titles ever and and she's looking at me giving me direct eye contact and john my friend john was standing right behind me like his mouth <laughs> his, his, his jaw was on the floor but i was actually weirdly used to this so you know he's just like rachel oh my god what like and my mom is just like trying to give me that indication of like hold on just a minute i'll, I'll be right with you you know meanwhile, meanwhile the vile craziness that's coming out of her mouth was so disconnected um from that so that was another um oh. moment when i recognized how funny it was because john it's, was just dying <laughs> it is hilarious these are the best stories i really i can't get enough of them um <clears throat> when you think about your audience is it diverse or is it are they all fairly similar the people who have were with you before and have sort of traveled with you what, what's your take on it Oh, I mean, yeah, I will say it, it leans queer, it leans towards LGBT, I mean, ten, you know, but it's beyond that, I, I think the demographic split across almost everything is diverse, like male, female, okay. um, race, I, I've, I've pretty much noticed that it could be also a result of being in a metro metropolitan Oh, right, that makes setting. sense. You know, I would show, I, I show my films in LA and New York and, and that's where I, you know, back in the day when you had a theatrical screening, you know, when I was doing my theatrical screenings. Um, yeah, I, I, I've i noticed that it's, yeah, luckily I feel, I feel really happy. I mean, I would say probably it, I, I don't have a, that many straight people mm. in my midst. <laughs> which yeah. is my, which is the um but but i've come to realize that that straight people are not the enemy and yeah. i also include them in my um audiences and in fact they're like the best ambassadors and and it's not even like an us versus them situation which i you know i think sometimes in the lgbt world it can feel really or film festival world like this is our little space right. but then you're like wait but people brought their moms and their families and their kids and da, 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 da. and like you, you know it's it's sort of a misnomer that we are um lgbt as in isolation from the rest of the world so That's so great. i you know, yeah i think on the lgbt spectrum of where my film circus of books showed um it was very 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 queer but beyond um you know i'm i'm glad to know that it has a wider audience Right, right. No, I like the way you put that. That's really helpful. Mm -hmm. So what have you not done? I'm still over here wiping my tears from those stories. Oh. Um, <laughs> There's a lot more. To this. Oh. <laughs> I really can't get enough of them. Um, so for childhood stories. <laughs> There's a new book. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. So what what have you not done that you still would like to do? actually making a narrative feature film that is you know a tr true narrative like the first narrative or the first feature film that I made was actually a musical art house film and it had no yeah. dialogue we showed it in this crazy way and like you know in, in art galleries and um you know I I'm I really want to make a much bigger significant mark as, with a feature film and Okay. Um, it's actually a musical film that I have written, and um, so so I have I have a script and I have it in in development. You know, it's one of those things now that I'm I'm in year six of developing this one project. You're like, okay, well, somebody was telling me recently that they're they're in their twentieth year on a film. So I was like, okay, okay, that's not that's not you know six years is okay. Like, it, right. it, this is a slow burn in the film world with with projects. Um, but yeah, um, there's that. And there's tons of stuff I haven't done. You know, I think I think when I look at what I really want to do though, it's it's becoming more focused on um, film projects. Uh, 
because I love, I really do love the medium. I, I, I absolutely love storytelling in this way. And, and I do actually really like collaborating. Mm -hmm. that, that's the thing I, I realized when I was an artist, just as a pure artist, you, you do so many things yourself and, and, and you do it sort of badly yourself. I realized like I wasn't the world's greatest editor, but I edited my film because, you know, I didn't have any money to hire an editor. So I'm just going to do it. And now I'm like, wow, no, my favorite thing is to work with someone who's a great editor, you know, and I can do this job well, but I have to isolate myself into this, you know, role here. And, you know, that's, again, I, I think I just really do love the collaboration on all sides. Right. In, it's sort of, it's like the ultimate challenge to make a film. And, and in that capacity, it's also, you know, even the business side challenge is interesting. Like all of it is challenging. <laughs> It's really, really hard. And, 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 and then when it, there's a, a break in the, you know, the flood, when you've done all this work, it's like, um, so exciting. I mean, you have to love it to do what you're doing. You, you absolutely have to love it. Yeah. And you have, I think you have to have all the perspectives that you have. It's gotta be really helpful. Um, listen, where can people find you who don't know where you are and. Okay. Kind of yeah. What, what's next? What's specifically next? And where can people find you? It's two questions in one. Okay. So, um, well, I'm on, let's see, Instagram. My, uh, my Instagram handle is future clown. And, um, actually this character right here, that you'll see behind me that that's where future clown started from, which is a art piece that I used to yeah. a performance art character. I, I used to, in order to take down people in positions of authority, such as the president, um, when, when he delivered his inaugural, meaning Donald Trump previously, mm -hmm. um, he did this maniacal, mm -hmm. and unbelievable inaugural address. And I didn't even know that it was going to be so maniacal, but I put on this future clown costume and lip synced it. And that was something that I would do you know, in, in moments um, of political activism, but more artwork. So, so my company is called Future Clown Productions. And so it came from that, you know, sort of the, the poking at authority through a clown character. Um, so futureclown.com takes you to my website and you can see pretty much everything I have there. And then, um, yeah, there's that Instagram and, um, I, I really don't use Twitter or Facebook a whole lot, but I know that I'm, you know, I am there. You can, but my, my name is Rachel Mason and, you know, you can, it, there's a lot, there's actually over a million Rachel Masons in the world. <laughs> oh, wow. So it's so really. So futureclown.com is probably the best uh, thing. Yeah, it's easier to find me there. And then as far as what's mm. happening next for me, you know, I have some really amazing doc projects that one I just got brought in to direct, which is totally, uh, no one's heard about it. So I don't know if I can announce it quite yet, but it's going to be a, um, a doc series that, um, that appears on HBO Max. Mm -hmm. And it's actually about um, a really shocking and crazy twisted story that played out on social media with a particular influencer. And so once I can say more about that, you'll, you'll hear more, but there's that. You'll come back? You'll come back, Rachel? Yeah, yeah. Happy to come back and talk All about right. that. That one has a lot of psychological components. Ooh. And then there's another project that's like my passion project documentary, and it's a cold case. Um, it's a 30-year cold case, and it's such a tragedy that it has never been solved. But a, a young man who died in 1990, uh, he was a gay porn actor and he was found dismembered his head and his feet were all that were found of him and to this day his entire case remains a mystery and and the story i've been following tracks not just the mystery of his murder and who might have done it but but how come it wasn't solved and and you you know learning this you know it's interesting for me growing up in that time 1990 mm -hmm. i was like you know a kid in the heyday of west hollywood here in la mm -hmm. and i go back to all the different places in this project and i'm reading you know police files and i'm like wow i was just right in the midst of all of these wow. moments 
but gay men were so under siege in 1990. They, they were just dying from AIDS, first right. off. But secondly, when they would talk to the police, they really were nervous about all the reasons a gay man might be nervous talking to the police, you know, having come off of, you know, the previous decade where it was still illegal to be gay and cops would just flat out arrest you for it. So, so now they're trying to, you know, communicate with the police. And I, I've been speaking to different people who, you know, might've had information, but didn't communicate in the right way, in a forthcoming way. So you can see why a crime wouldn't get solved. Um, and that's part of the story. It's sort of the, it's sort of the, which is one of my obsessions is like going back in history in the, in the specific area of gay history where we can understand why certain things existed in the way they did mm-hmm. only by understanding the, the cultural space that was the gay community. Wow. Well, I have to say they both sound incredibly interesting. Can't wait to hear more about them. Thanks for agreeing to come back on. Thank you so much again for coming on to talk to us. Look, we usually ask, how are you changing the narrative? But I think it's pretty obvious you're changing it. (laughs) You're changing it. Appreciate you, Rachel. Love you. And thank you so much for coming on. Really, really, really thoroughly enjoyed this. Well, I love you guys too. And it's nice to actually reconnect again. Yeah, for sure. Talk to you soon. Bye. Bye.